This uh, coming Wednesday evening here at the church is our uh, annual uh, congregational meeting in addition to the normal recurring uh, business such as adopting an annual budget and electing board members. We'll also be considering a very important question for the future of our church whether we should withdraw from our denomination known as MCC. It's the unanimous recommendation of our church's board of directors and our pastoral staff that we do withdraw, not out of malice, not out of anger. This is not about church politics, but genuine directional differences. Here at Life Journey, we want to be part of creating the church of the future. But it feels like our denomination is still trying to be church the way it was 30 years ago while charging us $50,000 a year to do that. It just doesn't feel like good stewardship of the resources that God entrusts to us. We love and bless the journey that we have walked together with our denomination, but, but we have to be about God's business. We have to be about not the past, but the future. Some of you, like me, are old enough. You can remember the comedian Flip Wilson, right? <laughs> Do you remember that on his comedy show, that this was in the 1970s for you young whippersnappers, on his weekly primetime comedy show, he did a recurring skit where he would be the pastor of a church. Do you remember the name of his church? The Church of What's Happening Now. I want us to be a church of what's happening now. I want us to feel and live in the fierce urgency of now and embrace God's bold vision to reform and transform the church in America today. Behold, I make all things new. God proclaims, Revelation 21, 5. That means we serve a God who is endlessly and restlessly creative. Which is why Brian McLaren suggests that perhaps the greatest sin we can commit is to refuse to evolve. To dig in our hills and say, God, I'm tired of stretching and growing. I'm tired of change and progress. I just want everything to remain the same. When churches do that, they lose their edge. So today, let's hit a pause for just today in our sermon series on managing our moods. And let's take a few moments to consider who is God calling us to be? What should this church look like over the next 10 20 years. What does God want the church of the future to look like? Let's pray. God, help us to keep up with you. There are so many hurting people in this hurting world who desperately need what you can offer them through churches like ours. So help us to live fully into the future that you have dreamed for us so that many who otherwise would not can find life in Christ. Guide us forward, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. I am worried about what the church in America has become. 
I began worrying back when I was a teenager, when certain things transpired in the church that my family was attending. There was a girl in our youth group, a, a friend of mine, who got pregnant. She was scared and overwhelmed. She made the courageous decision that she was going to keep her baby and marry the father. And you would have thought that the church would have celebrated that decision. Instead, they decided to make an example of her. A few days later, the pastor stopped by her home and told her parents that in case they were wondering, though they hadn't asked, in case they were wondering, he would not officiate at her wedding and the church would not host her wedding. So that at the very moment she most needed the love and support of her church family, they cut her out and tossed her aside. They were more concerned with being right than being good. No wonder so many people want nothing to do with churches these days. Most churches like to think that they're places of, of great welcome and grace, but so many then function as just the opposite. I saw a cartoon the other day that showed a church with a big sign in its front lawn that read, The Friendliest Church in the Valley. But then if you looked a little bit closer, you saw little signs here and there in that front lawn. One of them said, Stay off the grass. Another one said, don't litter. Another one said, no trespassing. And a fourth one said, do not park in the pastor's reserved parking space or your vehicle will be towed away. <laughs> By the way, remember that one. <laughs> the 11th commandment. Actually... Here at Life Journey Church, we deliberately have no reserved parking spaces for pastoral staff because Jesus said the leaders in his movement should be the servants of all. But there are a lot of things that Jesus said that churches are perfectly happy to ignore in the world today. A few years ago, I read a chilling story that stands as a warning to churches everywhere. It's a story told by a man who lived through the rule of Hitler in Germany. He tells how at the time he was a part of a, a small church that happened to be situated right beside railroad tracks. Most Sunday mornings as they were worshiping, a train would pass by. That was no problem until several years into Hitler's rule, as the train was passing by during their worship service one Sunday morning, the congregation could hear cries and screams coming from the cattle cars being pulled by the train. It was the cry of Jews who were being carried to a death camp. This happened the next Sunday as well, and then the next Clearly, this church needed to do something. And they did. They came up with a solution. The next Sunday, when they heard the train whistle off at a distance, they began to sing. So that, he says, by the time the train was passing by, we were singing at the top of our voices. And if we could still hear the cries over our singing... We just sang louder. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. That story stands as a warning. To this very day, that man, now old in age, says, to this very day, the, sire, the, the, the whistle of that train haunts me in my sleep. It's so easy for churches to become insular and inward looking and all about themselves and their people and protecting their people and making sure they have everything they need and the rest of the world can go to hell. 
Meanwhile, there are parents grabbing their children and fleeing the gang violence infested barrios of Latin America and risking life and limb to make their way north to the shining city on a hill where they stand at the border and look across and hope that maybe we will have mercy on them. What was that you said? Oh, I'm sorry. We couldn't hear you. We were singing, Jesus loves me, this I know. What I was saying is that there are mothers on the border whose babies have been ripped out of their arms and they still haven't been reunited. Oh, let's sing that second line even louder. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. But you don't understand. The world is full of suffering and problems. Look at racism. Rampant throughout our country. It affects jobs. It affects health care. It affects the education of children. Oh, that reminds me. For our second song, let's sing. Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white. They are precious. Pastor, you don't understand. Our son thinks he may be transgender and he's become suicidal and he really needs to know that he has the love and support of our church family. I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. What did you say? La, 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 la. You get the idea. No wonder so many people are fleeing churches. No wonder so many people say, if that's what Christianity is, you can have it. Keep your pretty little hymns and spare me the hypocrisy. And yet, there are so many people who need and want God in their life. There are so many who would love to learn the ways of Jesus. I've got to believe that the Spirit of God is anxious and restless to create something new, to create a movement that calls Christianity in America back to its roots in Jesus Christ. And here at Life Journey, we want to do our part to help make that happen, to bring the church of the future into being, to reform and transform churches in America, to bring them back to their roots in Jesus Christ. But of course, that begs the question, what does that mean exactly? What does God want us to look like over the next 10 to 20 years? What does God want the church of the future to look like? Three thoughts I'd like to share with you this morning. First, we are called to be a gymnasium for the imperfect, not a salon for the beautiful. Let me explain. No, no offense to all who are present <laughs> physically and online. But let me explain what I mean. It's a true story. A woman tells how one Sunday morning her family was on their way to church when she and her spouse stumbled into a huge argument. Back and forth they went. He said, she said, back and forth. Until... Their voices were raised. And then before long, the kids in the back seat were acting up. Until finally the tension was so thick you could cut it with a knife. Well, everybody just be quiet. Stop this, she says. They pull into the church parking lot, get out of their vehicle in sullen silence. Walk through the front doors of the church. And she says, as soon as we did, it's like a, a light switch went off. We painted on our happy faces and smiled and warmly greeted everyone like we're the, the best little Christian family ever. Not, she said, because we wanted to be hypocrites, but because we wanted to fit in. We wanted to belong. Nobody wanted to hear about our struggles. So we stuffed it inside. The cost of admission, the price of belonging. 
churches shouldn't be like that. I recently read an article that ran in the Chicago Tribune about an unusual kind of health fitness center that has opened up there. It's called Downsize Fitness. The article, in part, reads as follows. Health clubs usually feature attractive young men and women with perfect abs and toned bodies. As a result, the fitness industry is often perceived as catering mostly to fit, educated, middle to upper middle class clients. But according to one fitness expert, most people don't buy that picture. They know it's not realistic and they don't think they can achieve it. So the fitness industry, in a way, is its own worst enemy. Unfortunately, many fitness clubs alienate the very people who most need help. But downsize fitness is different. They deliberately welcome extremely unfit people, then walk beside them as they work through a program to get healthy and shed pounds. Tara Lawton is one of those people. She told the Chicago Tribune she used to belong to a normal fitness center. But she said, every time I was there, I I just felt like people were watching me and judging me and wondering what my 280-pound body was doing in a place like that. So she said, eventually, I just stopped going. But then she heard about Downsize Fitness and joined. She told the Chicago Tribune, I want to cry sometimes at how it's changed my life. Churches should be like that. Churches should have that same vibe. Churches shouldn't be places for the beautiful, near perfect, spiritually superior people to come together and celebrate their moral exceptionalism. No, church ought to be a no-judgment zone. Church ought to be the kind of place where real people with real problems who really want to get better come together to learn, support, and love one another along the way, which is what Jesus meant when he said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come unto me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. In the presence of Jesus, there was not judgment. Instead, there was gentle encouragement, challenge, and grace. Churches ought to be like that. We are called to be that kind of space. God wants the churches of the future to get back to their roots in Jesus. We all struggle. A few weeks ago uh, on a Tuesday morning, I was on my way into the church when I swung by the drive through at our bank to deposit a few checks. During this COVID crisis, I hate to go to the bank because as you move into the drive-thru, of course, there's that plastic container that you're supposed to put everything in and send up through the chute to go inside the bank. You just know that dozens of people have had their hands all over that canister. So every bank canister you touch is bound to be tainted with COVID, right? So I figured out a way to deal with that. Before I left home on that Tuesday morning, I was meticulous about filling out my deposit slip, filling in every blank perfectly, endorsing the back of my checks so that when I got, drove up at the bank, I was ready. I put on my latex gloves. I grabbed the canister, dropped everything inside, closed it, sent it up the chute thinking, I've got this figured out. A minute or so later, though, the teller comes over the intercom and says, Um, I'll need to see your ID. I said, oh, 
I'm just depositing checks today. I'm not taking any money out. He said, that doesn't matter. Now, that kind of rankled me because that meant with my now contaminated gloves, I was going to have to reach in, pull out my billfold, contaminating my billfold, fumble through my billfold, find my driver's license, and put my tainted driver's license in his canister. I said, you do understand I'm not taking it. Yes, sir, I understand. All right, I said, so I got my billfold out, hands all over everything, put my driver's license in the canister, shoved it back up the chute. Waited a bit, a minute later, he says, I'm sending out your receipt. I'll need you to sign it. I said, you do understand that I'm not taking any money out. I'm putting money in your bank. You're the one who ought to be signing, saying that you took money from me. He said, I'm sorry, sir, but those are the rules. I just work here. I said, well, then tell them I don't like their rules. I signed the receipt. I put it in the canister. I shoved it back up the chute. A minute or so later, it comes back. He says, have a nice day. As soon as I drove out of that drive-thru, I thought to myself, what did I just do? Jeff, why were you such a jerk? How can you be a Christian for all these years and still do stupid stuff like that? I felt like such a failure. And that's when I sensed God saying to me, that's why you need me in your life. And that's why you need church in your life. You've still got a lot of work to do. We all do. So let's get real. We are all here because we've got a lot of work to do. If you mess up, if you, like me, are a piece of work, if you, like me, still need work, and if you're willing to be honest about that instead of pretending, then you are in the right place because God is calling us to be a gymnasium for the imperfect, not a salon for beautiful people. It's what the church of the future needs to look like because it's what the community that gathered around Jesus originally was. But our calling, the calling of the church of the future, doesn't stop there. In addition to being a gymnasium for the imperfect, we here at Life Journey Church are also called to foreshadow the diversity of heaven rather than replicating the segregation that riddles the earth. You heard Sharon read earlier that beautiful vision from Revelation chapter 7, where John shares this, this vision of heaven and multitudes that are worshiping. <clears throat> Revelation 7, 9, after this I looked and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and all peoples and all languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb robed in white with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God and to the Lamb. And all the angels fell on their faces and worshiped God singing. What a beautiful vision of heaven. That is us. By which I mean, that is who we are called to be. We are called to be a Revelation 7-9 church. If heaven is going to be a place where there are people from every nation, all peoples, languages, and tribes, then shouldn't churches down here on earth strive to mirror that ideal. Isn't that, shouldn't we be an anticipation of that 
heavenly reality? If I be lifted up, Jesus says, John 12, 32, I will draw all people to myself. If we here at Life Journey Church are truly lifting Jesus up, guess what? We won't draw just one kind of people. Because if Jesus is lifted up, he is so beautiful. If we let him shine, that all kinds of different people will be drawn into this place despite our differences. You, most all of you know the history of this church. How we, like our denomination so many years ago, were formed originally to be church of refuge for LGBTQ people. It wasn't a choice that was being made, but rather a response to the necessity. The necessity of segre- <coughs> excuse me, segregating for the safety, spiritual and otherwise, of LGBT people who wanted to come together in worship. But we don't live in that world anymore. God is doing great things. Walls of hostility that long separated, segregated, straight from gay, from transgender, white from black, from brown, male from female, young from old, rich from poor, Methodist from Lutheran, Catholic from Baptist, liberal from conservative, Republican from Democrat, from independent, those barriers of hostility that have long divided humanity need to come tumbling down like the walls of Jericho and God is raising up churches like this to make that happen. We need to be about God's business. We can't be living like it's 30 years ago. It's not 30 years ago. God is restlessly inventive and creative and moving things forward and we need to keep up with what God is doing in this world. We need to stop being afraid of those who are different from us. We're all God's creatures. God's magnificent creatures. And we're all going to be stuck with each other when we get to heaven anyway. So we may as well learn to love each other down here on planet Earth. I remember years ago, the first straight couple that began coming to our church. It was a a young family, a husband, wife, and their newborn baby girl. He was an assistant professor at Purdue. They stumbled into the church one Sunday, loved what they found here, a church that's passionate about Jesus, serious about the scriptures, that celebrates diversity and encourages independent thought. Bingo, it's what they'd been looking for. So they worship with us the next few weeks. After the third week or so, after church one Sunday, he pulled me aside. He seemed a bit nervous. It was obvious he wanted to say or ask something. I said, go ahead, whatever it is, it won't offend me. What is it? He said, I don't know quite how to put this, but are we crashing the party? You understand what he was saying? They were sensitive enough to be worried that their presence in what was a church of refuge for LGBTQ people might be making some LGBTQ people, especially older LGBTQ people, feel less safe. So... They didn't want to do that if that's what was happening. Are we crashing the party? I chuckled and said, no. (laughs) I said, your family could fit in any church in in central Indiana. You could pick from any of thousands of churches the fact that you would choose 
to worship in this community is an honor and a blessing. And you are part of the Holy Spirit's work to try to bring healing to the church of Jesus Christ. So thank you for being here. You don't make us feel less. You make us feel safer. Welcome to the party. And they were a regular part of our church for several years before they moved out of state. They were the first of a great wave since then of straight people who are choosing to worship in a place where everybody is truly welcome. A little foretaste of heaven. This church has an opportunity to let its light shine throughout central Indiana in a way that will help bring down those walls of Jericho that have long divided people into their little tribal segregated communities. That's not what heaven's going to be like. That's not what Jesus' church was like in the first century when incredibly diverse people, slaves and masters, worshiped side by side when Jews and Gentiles worshiped side by side when male and female for a brief period of time in the earliest Christian church were equals until things snapped back and we went through centuries of discrimination against women. We need to get back to our roots in Jesus Christ and it requires bold people who are willing to help create churches of the future. Here at Life Journey Church, we are called to be a gymnasium for the imperfect, not a salon for the beautiful, number one. Number two, we are called to be a place that foreshadows the diversity of heaven rather than replicating the segregation that riddles the earth. And finally, lastly, number three, we are called to pour out compassion on the world rather than retreating from it. For God so loved the world. John 3, 16, and therefore, so should we. When a train passes by and we hear the cries of those who are desperate, instead of singing louder, we should stop what we're doing, go outside and say, my God, how can we help? So that when we do sing our songs, it can be with open hearts and open ears. In his book, uh, Simple Christianity, uh, Christopher Huertz tells a story about a time he went on a missions trip to India. He tells how one day he and four of his missions trip companions were walking down the streets in Kolkata when they came across someone who was lying in the middle of the sidewalk beneath a filthy fly-infested blanket. They could see a three-foot trickle of diarrhea running from under the blanket and into the gutter. Obviously, this person was either dead or dying. They stopped. One of them bent down and touched the shoulder of the person through the blanket. The body moved. They were still alive. So they gently pulled back the blanket to reveal the face of a young man, scared to death. When he realized they were there to help him, not to hurt him, Christopher says he began to cry uncontrollably for gratitude. They asked him his name, Tedela Doss. They didn't have much to work with, a bottle of water, some newspapers. They did their best to clean him up. And then they tried to hail a cab, but no taxi cab would stop. A crowd began to gather, not to help, but to gawk. Eventually, a cab did stop. So two of them with Tuttle got into the cab to take him to Mother Teresa's house of the dying. The other three stayed behind to continue their work, including Christopher. He says, as the crowd began to disperse, we realized that the whole time, we had been right in front of a church. A church that had a big sign that said, all are welcome. The irony, he says, is that this young man, skin and bones, was dying five feet from a church sign that said, all 
are welcome. In fact, Christopher says, maybe that's why he chose to lay down there. Maybe he was hoping that they meant what they said and that somebody from that church would come out and help him. Actually, Christopher says, while we were there helping him, some people did come out of the church. But they stayed behind the fence surrounding the church and never opened the gate. What kind of Christians are we going to be? What kind of church are we going to be? The church doesn't need any more fake love. Excuse me. The world doesn't need any more fake love from the church. The world needs to see the real thing. What kind of Christians, what kind of church are we going to be? We are called to be the kind of church that pours out compassion on the world. There is a reason why we partner with two homeless shelters here in Indianapolis. There is a reason why we partner with organizations in South Sudan, Guatemala, the Appalachians, and the Navajo Nation. There is a reason why we support 32 impoverished children across the globe. And there is a reason why we, during COVID we have opened a food pantry that delivers twice a week food to families that are in great need. For God so loved the world and so should we. Let me close with this. <clears throat> In Glenn McDonald's writings, he reminds us that when the Titanic hit the iceberg, there were 2,223 passengers aboard. The Titanic was equipped with 20 lifeboats that had enough seats for 1,178 people. But for some reason, only 705 people survived in the lifeboats. That means those 20 lifeboats sailed off with 473 empty seats. Why? We know the answer to that question because in, in inquiries that followed, a commission that was impaneled, sworn testimony was taken. They interviewed people from the various lifeboats. The scenario that unfolded on lifeboat number eight proved to be a common pattern. There was someone on lifeboat eight as they rowed away from the wreckage of the Titanic. The screams of people falling into the water behind them there was somebody on lifeboat eight who said, argued vigorously, we need to go back. We've got a few empty seats. But the majority overruled him. The majority said, desperate people who are drowning, they're apt to tip our boat over. They'll capsize us and we'll all die. He said, I would rather die in the waters than leave them behind. Quartermaster Hitchens said, it's no use going back for a bunch of stiffs. So they kept rowing out into the night, away from the cries. That pattern in some form or another repeated itself on every other lifeboat, except one, lifeboat 14. Lifeboat 14 had three seats remaining. They voted to turn around and come back. They pulled three desperate dying people from the water and saved them. Three people who will be eternally grateful. What kind of Christians are we going to be? What kind of church are we going to be? A Lifeboat 8 church or a Lifeboat 14? church. If there were more lifeboat 14 churches in this world, there'd be a lot more Christians in this world. They'll know we are Christians by our love. Here at Life Journey, we've come through a lot to get to where we are, but we're here now, and we're not looking back, and we're not going to live in the past. The future beckons. 
the potential of this church and the good it can do is enormous. Let's keep moving forward. Let's help create the church of the future. Church, the way it was always meant to be. Look out, world. Here we come. Amen.